Hey guys, it's MJ and in this video I want to speak about quantitative credit models. A uh, previous video, which is actually coming at the same time as this one, is I spoke about the qualitative credit models, so go check that one out if you want to. This one we're going to be focusing just on quantitative credit models. And what do we mean by this word quantitative? Quantitative means that we're going to be looking at financial data. So whereas the other one, the qualitative one, looked at, say, subjective factors, here we're actually looking at financial data. And the idea is that we want to get some sort of credit measure or we want to find out what is the probability of default. The reason why we want to know this is so that we can ask ourselves, well, is this a risk that we want to hold? Is this a risk that we want to transfer? And how much should we charge someone for, you know, being in the credit position? You know, what interest rate should we charge them um, depending on the probability of default? And this, I mean, if, if you can create a credit model that can correctly determine the probability of default, you're going to become very, very rich. You're going to win a Nobel Prize. You're going to become very famous because at the moment, most of these, or if not all, of these quantitative credit models, they don't work. And the reason being is that all of these models that we're going to be talking about have three fundamental flaws. Okay, The first is they lack data. So they built on data, yet there's not that much data when it comes to credit models. Specifically because each credit situation is kind of unique. So in order to try and get data on a whole bunch of unique events, I mean, it's very, very difficult to try and find information that is relevant um, in order to build your model. And then even when you do, there might not be enough to make a model from it. So lacking of data, that's a big one. The second one is the, the distributions that they use in these models. They use a lot of normal distributions. And like I've said countless times in these videos, is that we're going to be seeing skew distributions. So the distributions are skewed and they're also something known as leptokurtic. Remember, if this is say a normal distribution, which means a lot of the stuff's happening over here and this tails here is very rare, a leptokurtic graph will be something like this. Where the tails are way more fat and everyday movement is way more um, reduced. But on top of that, credit has also showed that this leptokurtic is also a little bit skewed. So we have something like that, which again distorts the mathematics because in these models, most of the time they are using the normal distribution. And the reason why they use the normal distribution is that because it makes the mathematics easy and it allows the computer to actually do it. At the moment, using these really complicated distributions just bogs down the computing power and it's incredibly difficult. Also, also, this is the other big thing, is you have the normal distribution, which has got two parameters, you know, the mu and the volatility. When you're coming to look at these leptokurtic things, the amount of parameters in them are way more complicated and it's very difficult to determine the shape. So not only are we lacking data, but we're lacking the mathematical distribution in order to be used for it. And then finally, another thing which these models don't take into consideration because of mathematical limitations is correlations. So the fact that if one person defaults, it's more likely that other people are going to default. Reason being is that person may be defaulted because of the terrible economic conditions, which is now affecting everybody. Hence, one default will cause a bit of, say, a domino effect, as in another one. But again, with correlations, very difficult to handle mathematically, especially when we're lacking data. So these models that we're going to be talking about have got three major weaknesses, lack of data, skewness of distributions, and correlation that isn't being taken into account uh, that well. So without further ado, we're going to be looking at, um, I think, how many are we going to be looking at? Five, five credit models, uh, quantitative credit models. I'm just going to be giving a very brief overview look at them, not going to be going into a lot of detail. 
Why? Because I'm not motivated to go into detail selling that is broken. But without further ado, let's get into some of the quantitative credit models. Um, the first one, or the first group, is known as the credit scoring models. Credit scoring models. So what these models do is they try and create a mathematical uh, credit measure from your fundamentals and your financial reports. So they'll look at a company and say, okay, what is your, you know, how much cash you have on hand? What are your assets? What are your liabilities? What are your ratios? All these type of things. The problem though with credit scoring models is that different industries will be affected by different accounting ratios. And specifically in, in various economies and in, in different environments. So let's say I create a credit scoring model of banks. Can I do that here in South Africa? I only have a limited number of banks in which order to see. I think in South Africa we've got something like six major banks, plus minus. So we've got plus minus six major banks. And the, the probability or, or the amount of defaults that have happened in the past has been very, very few. So very, very few um, credit events have happened on which to, to base our data. Also, we're going way back in the past, and you have to account for economic conditions, globalization, even apartheid, all these things come in and we just lack data. So even though the credit scoring model is pretty cool, it's, it's got, not, you know, works on the fundamentals and financial reports, it suffers from, you know, this lack of data. And also, like I said, for each industry is going to be different and in each economic environment. Hopefully in the future, as we're recording more and more data, we're you know, storing things, we're making better models, we've got access to foreign markets, we might see credit scoring models becoming more important and more usable in the future. The second one is the structural model. Okay, Structural models work a little bit differently. Whereas these models, credit scoring models, look at, say, the fundamentals and your financial reports, the structural model starts with your share price and its volatility. So we're looking at share price and we're looking at volatility. And we're going to use just these two things to determine your credit rating. And if you're thinking that sounds absurd, well, you're right. I mean... Straight away, we know that share price and volatility can be uh, influenced by, you know, market sentiment, herd mentality, bull runs, bear runs. You know, that can push the share price all around um, the market. And I don't think it's the best way to do it. Who, who came up with it? Well, in 1974, we had a guy called Merton. And his idea was... I'm going to use option pricing theory. You know, this is stuff that we used to value, say, call options. And he says, I'm going to use this to evaluate credit risk. Essentially, what his idea basically comes down to is a company will default if the assets become less than the liabilities. And so what he does is he models a call option on the company's assets. And if that uh, value falls below the liabilities, the people say, well, stuff it, we're not going to buy this asset. We're going to have the, you know, the, the, the right to refuse it, which they do, and they default. So as long as the price stays above the strike price of the call option, then the company's not going to default. And we work out the probability that it will fall below that strike price. Um, I mean, other guys like KMV have tried to extend on this model. They've also looked at, you know, um, distance to default and, you know, duration and all these other things. But like I said, there's a big disadvantage in that market sentiment is going to have this impact, which they can't really take away from. Also, by using call options and black scores formula, you're relying a lot on the normal distribution, which, like I've just said, is not the case with credit models, or at least what the, the little bit of evidence that we do have has been showing so far. So those are structural models. Next, I mean, we get something known as reduced form models. I mean, these things have got weird names. Reduced form models. Reduced form models, they are going to be using statistical processes, um, and they want to take a general economic uh, viewpoint and see how is the environment going around. 
So they would have something like a time series, and they'll like say market um, or model the, the economic environment as like a little curve that's jumping up around, and they say, oh look, there was a ten percent chance that it went into bad territory, um, and they'll try to work out the default from that. Um, it it takes a little bit too much of a broad view. It doesn't consider any of the company's uh, risk management. Uh, policies and procedures that they've put in place for themselves and it very much is a general economic uh, viewpoint instead of you know what my client or the person who I've lent to is actually going through or, or their individual risk. Um, there's another one called credit migration model this is also using actuarial techniques uh, let me write it here credit migration model and what this does is it wants to see how the credit rating changes over time. So what it does is it uses a Markov model. So it will have, say, triple A, then AA, then A, then BBB, and then let's say default. And what it does is it calculates what is the, the odds that AAA you know, downgrades and then upgrades say double downgrades or something like this and it it calculates these these odds and it tries to simulate it using a markov model you know time homogeneous um, however there is a lot of criticism that comes about by using markov model markov model says that the present state it contains all the information where we know with say a credit rating the the his, history might be more important um, it might not be as simple to just do it in a Markov model like this. Uh, like I said, there, there are so many more criticisms that you can go in for each of them. I think for the exam or just for general overview, it's fine to know, you know, the basic three. Um, finally, I mean, the last one, I'm not going to go into too much detail about what it actually is, but it's the credit portfolio model. Okay, credit portfolio model. And what this model does is it tries to look at credit risk holistically, which I think is a good thing. It's a good thing to look at the credit risk holistically, but you're going to start lacking detail. Like I said, you want to consider um, the individual companies and what they're doing, but one of the big benefits of credit portfolio model, by having a holistic view, you can take into effect, say, diversification. However, like we said in the very last weakness, is that there is, or there does from the empirical evidence, seem to suggest that there is correlation um, with these credit risks, and therefore this diversification benefit, which the credit portfolio model tries to seek out, might be done um, in vain, seeing that it does not actually exist. Um, specifically, if the whole market goes down, there could be a, a bigger systemic risk that the credit portfolio model doesn't consider. So overall, I mean, those are, are the five um, big types of credit models. Each type will have its own, I mean, credit scoring models, there's a whole bunch you can look at credit scoring models. There's a whole bunch of structural models. There's a whole bunch of reduced form models. There's a whole bunch of credit migration models. There's a whole bunch of credit portfolio models. So we've just looked at five of the broad categories. There are lots and lots and lots and lots. And why are there lots? Because none of them work. Okay? None of them work in isolation. And so what companies do is they have to use a bit of a blend. So they're going to, when they come to managing credit risk, they're going to use quantitative and qualitative models at the same time. And they're going to use quite a few of these on the same credit risk, which becomes a little bit problematic because... Now think of the administrative burden of trying to run the same credit risk through all these various models that look at various things. I mean, the amount of information that you need for these credit models is absolutely huge. And that's why we're going to see um, in our next video tomorrow, when we're going to be talking about you know, managing credit risk, we're going to see that there is a big advantage in being a big financial company so that you have the staff or the infrastructure in order to handle this amount of administrative burden. 
But your credit risk is huge. Um, I mean, these credit models are normally employed just by financial intermediaries, making large amounts of credit risk, uh, and um, sorry, making large amounts of loans that have large amounts of credit risk. But remember, most businesses will have some form of credit risk, whether they're selling to uh, customers who are only going to pay them later, or you know, their uh, suppliers. I mean, there's there's a lot of credit risk when it comes to doing business, and that's why I said if you can create a model that is very sleek efficient and useful and doesn't rely too much information and can accurately predict the probability of default you're probably going to win a Nobel Prize so good luck with that I don't know if it is possible I mean this could actually be one of the areas where artificial intelligence could play a big role in helping out the financial markets but anyway that's all I've got time for I hope you've enjoyed this video check out the other one that I've released at the exact same time on quantitative models and I will, sorry, on qualitative models, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for managing credit risk. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be looking at some of the dodgy deals people do and how you can make a lot of money by playing golf um, in the financial world. So yeah, make sure you subscribe to tune in for that one tomorrow. Cheers, guys.